Well, anyway, uh, we have a, I have a map of the, there it is. Okay, it's working now. We have a map. I don't know if the, I did it or Joy did it, so you did it. Okay, well, this is a map of the persecuted nations or the, where believers are being persecuted around the world. Oh, oh perfect. Thank you. Where believers are being persecuted around the world, and obviously the dark red is where the persecution is greater, and the you know light orange or the orange is where it's I guess it's a little bit less. But what's really you know interesting in some respects, you could say the world is doing a little bit better. Back uh, in the early '90s, the Iron Curtain fell, and you know, some of those believers that were being persecuted have more freedom today. And and certainly we pray for pre- freedom. We should be praying for the persecuted believers around the world. And I think it's important that we continue to incorporate that into our prayers. What's also, in a sense, a blessing, and you can see by this map, is that the United States and Europe are not listed as one of those persecuting nations. And that's, that's a good thing. But we have to also be careful because we need to understand that it, it may not always be that way. And even today, we know of examples, maybe not from a national perspective or point of view, but we do know of examples of people who have been, whether it's in the workplace uh, or it's been um, in their ministry, um, out in the public square, who have been persecuted for their faith. And not just their faith, but what their faith compels them to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to remember to keep praying for our country and praying for Europe and praying for not just the countries that are in red or orange, but the countries that are, in, that are not. Because as John Adams, one of our founding fathers said, he said that our constitution, or you could even expand it to you know, the, the Western world, the Judeo-Christian ethic, uh, the rule of law, was made for a moral and religious people. And it's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And what I take that to mean is that you can't just set it and forget it. You can't just say, well, we have a constitution, we've got lawmakers, we've got judges, courts, and that's it. We're good. Let's go about our merry way. We have to continue to stay vigilant. And I believe in some respects... That's what Daniel 3 teaches us. Or one of the things, Daniel chapter 3 teaches us many, many things. But one of the perspectives that I'm looking at uh, this morning, and even though they are in captivity, and they really are in a different place than us, they really are like that persecuted believer, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. I think it's very important to remember their Hebrew names. They really are like those persecuted believers today that are living in a land where they have no rights and really the only hope that they have is in God because at any time their leader, uh, the people who they're seeking to submit and, and work under and live under can imprison them, torture them, and execute them. And there are believers, there are people today, not just believers in Yeshua, but others as well that live under that type of system. But I kind of also want to talk to the people who are living in that blank nation, like the United Nation. And that was Open Doors, incidentally, who put that map together. I also want to talk to us, because like John Adams said, we can't just set it and forget it. And when we look at the first part of this text, we can see sort of a type or a picture of what we need to be looking for and praying against and standing up to so that we can keep our country, at the very least, a nation that allows us to worship our God in spirit and truth openly and publicly. We've been very blessed that we do have, we live in a country that has been, at the very least, neutral and at times very much supportive of our faith and allowing us, I mean, here we are today, we're in a public building, no fear of being arrested or being shut down or anything of that nature, and that's a good thing. 
And we want to be vigilant and pray for that. And that's very important. So you see, it doesn't matter who your governor is, whether you like them or not, or your mayor or your president or anything like that. We have to pray for them that that always will be. But if it isn't, if one day or you wake up 25, 50 years from now, a year from now, whatever it might be, and you live in a different America, an America that many, uh, an America that's like where many believers are living today, are we ready? Not just are we ready for that, but, but, well, are we ready for that? Would we know how to live and function? But do we have in our mind what John Adams was saying in the sense that are we willing to be recognize it, relate to it, and respond to it in a way that's biblical, that honors the Lord and not just what we want. And so, oh, okay. so one of the things we learn and see is that any government that's hostile to God's scripture is, an advers- is adversarial. Like when we say, well, what is an adversarial government? It's any government Um, that's hostile, or any hostile government, it's any government that's hostile to God's scriptures. And Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon is a type, a type of adversarial government. So as we look at Daniel chapter 3, and especially these first 15 verses, we see a government that really is a type of a hostile government to the God of scriptures. Now, I could have just said hostile to God, Because God is greater than his scriptures. But I don't want to just say God. I want to be very clear that it's really the the God of scriptures. It's the God of the Bible that keeps this world holy, righteous, and good. It's the God of the Bible that rules and reigns and has all authority. And he's given that authority to Yeshua, our Messiah. So let's uh, let's take a look. Daniel chapter chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon shows us how to recognize hostile governments. Shows us how to recognize hostile governments. Verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so when we look at governments that are adversarial to the God of scriptures, one of the things we notice is that they like to honor or give themselves glory. And so the first thing we see as we look at Daniel chapter 3 is we see a government and an individual who is setting up an image. That image is most likely of himself. And that may even have been why in Daniel chapter 2 he was so alarmed of his own dream because that head may have looked like his own head. Now we know that from chapter 2 that Babylon is the empire of gold. And this golden image is emblematic of his, of his empire, as Daniel also related to them. We also, I've also shared that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebu, may very well be the god of gold from the Egyptian pantheon of gods that traveled through the whole Middle East. And so Nebuchadnezzar, that god of gold, and gold itself is a symbol of divinity. So already we have some issues With that, but in a sense, we can't just say anytime there's a statue of an individual that that's unbiblical. I mean, we have statues of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr., and and those statues are to honor and respect and memorialize our history. There's nothing wrong with that, but you could see that in this particular case, there's a call to all the officials of Babylon, and then that word dedication, that it's this huge statue. 90 feet high by 90 feet wide, and it is, it is to be dedicated. And that word dedication actually means Hanukkah, it's the word Hanukkah. Um, it's used also by Ezra when dedicating the temple. And so something a little bit, something more, uh, something off is happening here. It's not just to memorialize or commemorate. 
it is uh, becoming, it appears to be a religious object, uh, an object of worship and an object that would be concerning. Now, one of the things as I go through the, the list that I believe is being projected to us in these 15 verses in Daniel, it's not that just one of them will trigger a problem. And it's not necessarily that two or three. I can't really tell you how many of these would actually make a government adversarial. It could be one, it could be all, it could be several. There is a spiritual element. It's not step one, step two, step three. These are deep issues to consider when we pull the trigger in our own hearts or as a community and say, this line and no further. But right now there is, there is when we look at a government that becomes adversarial, it's that the government itself or the individual in that government believes that they are supreme. That they start to reject themselves as supreme and that they need glory for their own sakes. This is one of the renditions of the image. The image. And incidentally, Nebuchadnezzar also appears to be a type for the Antichrist. Because in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, the Antichrist himself will make an image, an image, and that that image will be worshipped, uh, will require worship. So there's also some definitely tribulation or end time significance to this. And, and those of us who are premillennial and futurists, we do uh, believe that before the tribulation, things will get worse. And so some of these signs will become more and more apparent, apparent. Parent, excuse me. Now, maybe not in our generation. Maybe, you know, and we pray for it. And I've heard a lot of people talking about revival. So I'm not saying this is set in stone. I've gone to different areas uh, of the of, uh, talking to different people. And that word revival and, 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 and a belief that there may be another revival coming. So this, I'm not, again, saying this is set in stone and this is what's going to happen. But I am saying that it is important for us to be vigilant and to be aware and Dan, this chapter of scripture uh, gives us that, that grace of understanding. Verse 3 and 4. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image. And again, that image is probably most likely his likeness that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples and nations and languages. Another aspect or element of an adversarial government is one that is unrepresentative, will employ unrepresentative control or undemocratic or in the sense that the people will have no say anymore. It will be either a government authority or a dictatorial authority, or possibly some combination where we will just be beholden. And so we see that they're being summoned, they're being called, and they're being commanded, and they don't really have a say in it. And so this is another thing. And so we are blessed in this country to have a representative constitutional republic, and we get to vote for them. And, and as followers of Yeshua, there's nothing wrong with wanting to maintain that um, representation. Um, nothing wrong with, because as I look at it, the Constitution is the highest law of the land. The Scriptures is the highest law, period. And so wanting to vote for our representatives does not violate Scripture. That being said, you and I can, by God's grace, function as our fellow believers do in other lands, in a land that doesn't allow that representation. We can still be citizens. They can't take that away. But that being said, we still, I think it's still very pertinent and prudent to want to maintain a nation that allows us to worship in freedom. Next, we have an adversarial government will reject God's word. And this is really probably the crux of the matter as we look at these verses. It says, you are commanded. There's that word again, instructed, commanded. Uh, there's no choice in the matter, O peoples, nations, and language, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, 
trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. I mean, that really is the heart of the matter. Um, but in this particular case, and we'll get to the fiery, the burning furnace in a moment, but it is the act of worship. The act of worship. That really, worship is only for God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of, of David. The God of Moses. Isaiah. God of the Bible. He and he alone is the object of our worship. And why is that? Because he is good. He's pure good. Anything else you desire to worship, think you should worship, aren't sure, it's not good. It will ultimately bring to destruction, to pain, to suffering. Whether it's yourself, whether it's another person, whether it's another so-called God, whether it's a different type of ideology, a crusade, it doesn't matter. Um, a, a, um, an idea, it doesn't matter. It's the God of Scripture that keeps our compass straight north. It's turning to him, looking to him, worshiping him. That's why this part, you know, when we sing, and, and notice that you see like a worship service here. It's not just a command. It's not just a statue. It's not just an angry or hostile king or government authorities that are, are in line with his, with his rule. But it's couched in a worship service. He wants to be, and he is projecting from his own religion, a type of God-man, an ant, a literal antichrist. Except he isn't the God-man. He's a man who seeks the adulation of God. And, and we've seen this before. We're going to see it throughout history. We see it with Rome, with the Roman Empire. We saw it with Antiochus IV. That's part of the Hanukkah story. And so this is, of course, and, and to some degree, I would hope the easiest to recognize. The easiest to recognize. When we are called to worship, I mean, sometimes I think that our nation gets a little bit too much into science. Where we, you know, you're not for science, you're for science. You know, it's like, it's almost like there's no head yet, but sometimes I, 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 it's almost like a religious quality. Science is good. There's nothing wrong with science. But science is also skeptical. You know, I, I read a scientific paper a few times. You know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm a history person. But I read a scientific study. It was, you know, long and, and, and it really... And what was really cool about it, and I really appreciate it with the people who write it, is they're very, it's very non-definitive. You know, it's like this could happen if this, and that could happen if that, and when all this is together, then these things happen. And I thought that was very informative and appropriate and, and worthwhile. And so it's not either or, it's both and, but true science doesn't set itself up as a religion to be obeyed and follow. It sets itself up as important, pertinent information, um, some more uh, closer to what's going to happen than others, some a little bit more speculative than others. But it sets itself up as important information for godly men and women to make important and informed decisions. And so I just think that we need to be vigilant about that. I can't worship at the altar of education, science, professors, politicians. I appreciate them. I respect them. Um, I want to encourage them to do their jobs to their ability. But we can only worship the God of heaven Amen. who came down and put himself in human flesh, dwelt among us. And he is not only worthy of our worship, he receives our worship. This is very important. Those of us who follow Yeshua, he is to be worshipped. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's over seven times where he received worship. So don't be confused by others that might say, well, he's the Messiah and this, that, but we're not supposed to worship him. He receives worship. He'll receive worship. He receives worship in the, in the book of Revelation. There's nothing wrong. The Father's okay with that. And so we are worshipers at our core. I'm trying to, maybe I'm spending too much time on this, but I want to make it clear. We're worshipers at our core. That's who we are in Yeshua. Next, 
We adversarial governments will attempt to destroy their opposition. Attempt to destroy their opposition. And, you know, this is really important. And as Jews, it's more important to our heart um, that we need to be, when we, when we see it get this far, where we see others trying to be destroyed or hurt or harmed or killed, whether it's us or somebody else, we really do need to step up. Even if it might be too late for our own safety, we need to step up. We need to be vigilant. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came toward, toward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to Nebuch King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 11. However, and whoever, excuse me, verse 11, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Hallelujah. Amen. That there are three men that have that kind of courage. You know, I mean, that's just gives me goosebumps. That they, with all of that music, huge image, that they will not worship. They don't bow down. And at this point, I just want to, to note that, that that's the object. They have now put themselves in opposition to Nebuchadnezzar, to Babylon. And Babylon, that adversarial government, that empire is seeking their destruction. We're going to, we'll come back to that. But first, the adversarial government will eventually expose their unbiblical character. And also, I want to just say that it's not necessarily in this order. I don't think that this is, has to be a progression. You know, the adversarial governments might expose their, and that is very small, I'm sorry, that's very small font. Um, uh, but they, don't, they won't necessarily expose their, they could expose their character early. I mean, obviously, in the text here, at verse 13, it seems like it's more at the end of the situation, but it could be earlier as well. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar, when, when individuals stand up for God in his presence, the God of Scripture, and they will not bow down, and we know, and interestingly enough, the Ten Commandments this morning, the first three commandments, we can't have graven images, we can't have a God before us. And we can't take the name of the Lord in vain. We cannot blaspheme him. And it is, you know, and so, well, how does, let me just, how does Nebuchadnezzar react to this? Well, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So, that, so they brought these men before the king. This is, he'll be, this is not the last time that he will be in furious rage, but do you think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were trying to upset the king? Were like, hey, let's really get under the, the old man's skin today and really upset him. No, not at all. Not at all. But they, they were standing for the truth. And they put their lives in jeopardy. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't just say, well... You know, I understand they're of a different religion or whatever. Let's give them an exemption. They can step aside. No, he was furious. He was enraged. And it revealed his character. It revealed his character. Next. I, hmm, I'm sorry about the font this morning. And for some reason, it's not coming through the whole. I see. It's not projecting. So this is a time when you could grab your scriptures. Uh, if you don't have them, there's also Bibles underneath. The, um, but for some reason, this is my uh, PowerPoint did not translate to the PowerPoint over there, which is okay. But you can grab your Bibles, and I'll try to read to you um, what's going on. And there's also scriptures, if you don't have one, underneath the chairs there. Adversarial governments test our faith in God's protection. They test our faith. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Azariah, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, gives them another chance, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, baptite pipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And then he goes on and he says, And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Who is the God who will deliver? And so in this particular case, he tests their fate. You know, the adversary, and really what is an adversarial government, is really a representation of the adversary himself. And whether we live in an adversarial government or not, you can start to see that this is these sort of occurrences, they, they affect our own individual life. And the adversary is going to want, when you're in a difficult situation, say, How, who can help you? No one can help you. He's going to want you to believe that there is no hope. There is no deliverance, no protection for you. And so that is one of his schemes. And that is where he attacks at the heart. And, and incidentally, you know, it, this fear of death and death itself is, is a prime motivator for the enemy to conform us and to get us to do what he wants us to do, to get us to disobey God, to get us to worship something else or believe more on something else than on him. And, and, and we know from Hebrews, we just read this this week with a group of uh, fellow believers, that Hebrews, that Yeshua came not only to deliver us from death, but from the fear of death. Because it's in death and the fear of death that we are under great bondage and that he came to free us so that we could live, for, we could live with him in freedom and spirit and in truth. This is a picture of pagan Rome um, after, during the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. Um, one of the things that pagan Rome used to do was it would see who was loyal, just like Nebuchadnezzar. And it would ask people to put some incense into an altar that was burning before, before one of the Roman gods. And if you didn't do it, You'd either be an enemy of the state or they would know that you were a believer and they would either prison, torture, harm, take your wealth, whatever the punishment was under that governorship. They didn't do it all the time, but periodically there would be a persecution against non -Rome people, against Christians or people who didn't believe the way the Romans believed. And this would be a way to root them out. And we see this strategy. We see it in the Hanukkah story, which I referenced earlier. Uh, with the having to um, kneel or, or pray or uh, before the altar of, a, of the pig and eat the meat at the table um, at Hanukkah, eat the unclean to show that you're loyal, eat the slaughtered animal from the pagan sacrifice. And so are we ready? The, you know, I, I have here as our application to stay vigilant. Are, we, are there things that we are prepared to resist? Are there going to be things that, that we're going to be asked to do that we know is unbiblical? And are we ready? Now, maybe not in our lifetime, maybe not in our generation, um, where the stakes are that high. But even in smaller things, in, in just day to day, at work, somebody asks you to sign a form that you know you're not supposed to sign or tell somebody something that really isn't true. Or something you don't really believe in. You know, little things that aren't necessarily going to be your death or imprisonment. But will harm your conscience. Or ultimately weaken our faith. Now there's always repentance. There's always, you know, and, and, and really we can't do this in our own strength. You can't stay vigilant in your own strength. You need the God of heaven. As Pastor Michael shared in the Lord's Supper. The new covenant, I believe Elijah shared it as well, the new covenant that really is the spirit coming into us to guide us and to empower us to stay vigilant. And it does happen through worship. The more we worship, 
I mean, I used to believe the more I just read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, the more I would be able to overcome some of my difficulties and struggles. But I have found not limiting scripture, but adding worship, singing, worshiping, trusting, going to God as often as I can, submitting to him, that those areas were the areas where the, where the greater growth would come, coupled with the teachings of the word and, and godly men. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon shows us how to respond. Let's look at the response um, to adversarial governments or to the adversary. We respond to the conflict with resolve in our God. Resolve. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. You see, when you stay vigilant, when you're in the word, when you're worshiping, when you're in community, when you under, when you, it's not that you're, you've arrived, it's that you understand where the direction is. You understand the path and you want to stay to it. God's ability, his grace, his power, his spirit will just continue to guide you and, and propel you. And so it's in that that you gain that resolve. It is, in some respects, a lifetime of relationship, but also it could happen in a moment. God can do a quickening for the, the humble heart. And just notice they had resolve, they had determination. And this is not the first time. Back in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not eat from the king's meat. Or the king's table, I should say. And God honored that and allowed him to be a, a vegetarian. I hope that's not for the rest of his life, but maybe it is. <laughs> and um, and he, was, <laughs> he was strong and, and satisfied. Strong and satisfied. And a testimony. And, and you know, I, one of the questions is, where's Daniel? You know, maybe you're asking yourself, why is Daniel not here? And, and really, honestly, I've, I've read a lot of, you know, on this. I, nobody's really certain. But one idea is that he was exempt. The king just exempted him. He knew he was Jewish. Uh, maybe he knew about you know, Shadrach, Meshach, but, and, and Abednego, obviously, uh, to some degree. But he knew about Daniel. Daniel revealed the dream, and he just sort of exempted Daniel. Daniel may have been the one person who wasn't, um, who wasn't forced to, into this worship. I think that rationale... Sounds good, but at the same token, where was you know why was Daniel not available to his friends? Um, again, we have to remember this is part of the sovereignty of God that God wants to do a testimony and a witness before the king. But our response first is to be re to be resolved in our God, to be to be vigilant in Him, and to recognize that yes, am I able when I see blatant disregard for scriptures and truth? To say, I'm not going to eat from the king's table. I'm not going to participate in this act of worship that would be blaspheming the Lord. Am I going to stand for that truth? Um, I believe God can make each and every one of us ready for that. I know he can. I know he wants to. We respond to the conflict with confidence. So resolve and then confidence or faith, confidence with fidelity, with faith. It says in verse 17 and 18, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and, we will, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so they respond with confidence in God. They respond with fidelity. That's the answer they give him. And what's really, I think, such a, an amazing blessing is they aren't... And, I, and sometimes I believe this is where we kind of make the mistake. 
I can't sit here and say to you that every time you are resolved in the Lord and every time you're confident and you're faithful, that you're going to be delivered from every situation. I don't necessarily think that's what we're called to. We do know of situations where, yes, we will be delivered. We'll be delivered from an illness. We'll be delivered from a bad situation at work. We, we, may, we know of people who've been delivered from near death at the hands of others. But there are going to be times when we've been called, and we see this historically. When I say we, maybe not you and I, but in this present age, where God has called us to martyrdom. Not just to be living witnesses, but to give our lives. Jim Elliott comes to mind, but there's so many others. So many others. And, and I love about this is they say whether we live or die, it doesn't matter. You know, that's, that's the mindset. Of, of a really mature, on-fire believer in this particular situation. So it's like, no matter what, we know our God can save us, but if he doesn't, we're not going to serve your gods. You know, and, and you'll remember us. You, know, you, you will, I mean, people are remembered in both life and death. Um, showed example of that in a moment. We respond to the conflict with non-vengeance towards our enemies. I said non-vengeance. Um, if you look at uh, verse... And, and by non-vengeance, I mean at the very least, we don't have hatred. Whatever our response, it's not hatred. It's, it's a biblical response. It's a response of truth. It's a response that maybe from the outside appearance could look like there's hatred but there's no hatred. There's love. There's a non-vengeance because we know that vengeance is of the Lord. It says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. So here we go. He's really upset. He's not being worshipped. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. So there's that number seven. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Now, what's really interesting about this, and this really is the response of the early anti nicene body of Messiah, church. By anti nicene means before Nicaea, before the Council of Nicaea. This is really how they responded to Roman persecution. You don't see these three men barricading themselves, looking for weapons. You don't see them trying to take as many of the guards out as they can. You don't see them even lunge for the king to try to, you know, kill him. They really just made their proclamation. They preached, in a sense, their gospel, that their God is greater than him. In a sense, he knows this, because in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had that dream in which his empire is finite. It will end. Another empire will come. But they allow themselves to be bound and to be thrown into the furnace. Now, again, that is a very deep and difficult, and I'm not, situation, and this is one example, and there, there is a historical uh, line that, that practiced a more nonviolent, non-vengeance um, response to persecution. And so, I'm not here to say that this is the only response but looking at the text and looking at history, this is a, one of the major response. There are other responses, of course, in which arms are taken up. And, you know, I think every, every believer has to follow their conviction on that. But in this particular uh, situation, their response, they preached, they did not bow, they had, held their heads high, but they, they allowed themselves. They went bound into the fiery furnace. And... Uh, another example of that, as I was saying, is Polycarp. Polycarp was um, a pre-Nicaea believer. This is back when the faith was completely illegal. 
different provinces it was more illegal than others and he would not you know very quickly he would not put the incense he refused and he taught his disciples the same and they captured him and they ultimately burned him alive now he actually didn't burn alive they captured him they tried to burn him the story goes that the fire kept being blown out and so he eventually was executed but this is an example of where god didn't fully deliver him in the situation of shadrach meshach and abednego they were delivered which we'll see in just a moment but but he was a powerful witness and we know about him today. We're, we're guaranteed heaven. We're not necessarily always guaranteed freedom from harm. It depends on how you're called and what your witness is. But through Yeshua, through faith in Yeshua, we are guaranteed heaven. And we're, we're also walking his presence and his joy and that eternal abundant living. Eternal abundant living. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon shows us how to relate. So in a sense, the previous section was internally. But you can also look at this corporately, how to relate to these hostile adversarial governments or individuals. We relate to them by living for God. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, I always think about this. When I watch like these movies, uh, I don't watch a lot of them, but you know, the superhero movies where the good guys and the bad guys and they're fighting it out. And I always feel bad for the people who are working for the bad guys. I'm like, what's their motive? <laughs> you know, they're just, they're either getting killed or mistreated and all that stuff. And it's like, what are you living for? What is this guy doing for you that ultimately you're willing to work for him? Is it just money? Is it just safety? What is the point? And, and really we see these men whose job it is to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. And what happens to them? They die. That's the end of a life living apart from God. And so we relate to them by living for God, for living for a greater purpose. Really, so many people receive that witness when we stand for God. You know, think of the centurion who was there watching Yeshua, really the first martyr of the body of Messiah, die he said this must be the son of god there's there are people who are somehow by god's grace reached through our fidelity to the end in the same manner people who are carrying out those orders they they ultimately die for nothing and sadly these men died for nothing they died without hope they died for a a false god we relate to them by dwelling with God. We dwell with God. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to, this, to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God, of the gods, son of gods. And so we dwell with God. And that's what I was alluding to a moment ago. We walk in the presence of God that no matter what the external situation is, you can know God in that powerful, real way. He's with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. That's why he came. That's why Yeshua came. This is a precarnate Precarnate image or picture or person, really, the precarnate, I should say, let me say this correctly, the precarnate Yeshua with them. That's what I believe. And, and he is gathering them in exile, in a place of bondage and hardship. And that's what he wants to do for you and me. That's what he, and that to me, I mean, if we experience, and, and we've, we've heard of many people who've been persecuted talk about their situation, not as just the worst thing ever, but that they knew Messiah deeper and with greater joy. And we relate to them by trusting in God, trusting in him. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. And so they did come out of the fire. They trusted in God. Whatever happened, they were fine with. They'd already, they, in many respects, they had made their witness. They had trusted in God. And they were delivered. Because God had a deeper, more for them to do on this side of eternity. And I love the fact that Nebuchadnezzar says, he says, servants of the Most High God. That was the result. I mean, when we think about it in our own lives, what result are we looking for? Are we looking for, are we, why are we here? Why are we in this? Are we here because we're hoping Yeshua will answer some prayer for our finances or for a better life? Uh, are, you know, are we here because, you know, we want to enjoy things um, and, and, and have comfort. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but that's not the highest priority. I'm sure that on their day-to-day -day life, they wanted to do their job, these three men, enjoy their life, and, and then go to be with Abraham, go, to, go on to paradise. And live the best life they could under the circumstances. But one day, an image, an image happened. And they had to make a choice not to bend the knee to that image. And throughout the process, I have no doubt that it was very frightening and scary. And they didn't necessarily know the end. But they resolved in their heart. The three of them together, and we can also see that in unity, it's always better to be in unity than to be divided. Wouldn't that be interesting if one of them just said, you know, I don't mind bending, I'll just pretend. And the other two were like, no, we can't, and then they had a squabble. Well, that didn't happen. They were unified, and they did not bend the knee. They were prepared for whatever was waiting for them. And they got to hear... They got to hear, servants of the Most High God, come out. Now, not everybody is privileged with that. Some martyrs have gone on. There were many, as I said, and I'll just close with this, there were many in the Roman Empire, pagan Rome, that did not take the incense. There are many people in history that have not taken, that have been martyrs. But what was really exciting about Rome is that whether they heard it or not, eventually Rome would say, the God of Scripture is God. And they would collapse. And there would be a new era. And so, sometimes we have to look at these things corporately. Uh, instead of just individually. And if, you know, I wanted to say, you know, if you don't yet know the Lord, or you don't have this resolve in your heart, ask Him. He'll give it to you. Let's pray. Abba, Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord. Your word is true. It's good. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be faithful to you. I pray, Lord, by your grace, the power of your spirit, that you would give us the, the, you just give us the grace to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to be like Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, to be that winsome, respectful, yet determined follower so that nobody could cast a charge of insolence as we stand for you. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't yet know you, I just pray they would turn to you, Lord God. Experience the presence, the joy of living for you and having an eternal, eternal life an abundant life in you as your witness. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Yeshua's name. Amen.